Uh, good afternoon, it's me again, <clears throat> Jean-Louis Van Bellen. Uh, I did a, quite a few uh, very technical things, lectures on, um, on YouTube, on uh, physics. Today, actually, um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the broad philosophical concepts and uh, um, actually on my research gate, page i wrote that actually that i'm sort of more interested in the uh, what i would call like the um the epistemological uh, foundations of physics you know what kind of concepts do we use and what kind of definitions you know of space time um particle what's the idea of a particle in quantum physics is it something permanent huh? um so um, that's what I'm going to do today. Um, there's a few um, things that trigger this. Uh, I get I get good feedback on my videos. I also get a lot of uh, uh, nonsensical questions um, or people who try to sort of, uh, you know, who ask me things like, uh, well, you believe charge is really the essence in, in reality and that charge can cannot be further reduced. Um, but well, you know, I believe that charge is perhaps some, you know, space-time oscillation or something. Um, uh, these things don't speak to me, and I, um, I, I, I will, uh, I will talk about that in this lecture. Um, it's also sort of for myself to to check and and reduce really everything to the the, the very bare bone. Uh, I said my motivation has always been a little bit to sort of um, understand. Um, there are a lot of gurus out there who will talk about, uh, you know, 10 dimensional, uh, strings or, uh, other things where I'm going like, you know, if I don't get that, if I don't feel that, then I think there's a lot of people who sort of, uh, don't understand that theory. Um, because, um, you know, we want to understand things and what does it mean to understand something? It means to understand something in, you know, three dimensional space, the space we are living in. Uh, it means to, um, you know, our concept of time, it goes one way only. Um, time can't be reversed. Um, I'll explain why in this lecture. So there's, there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm not a professional academic. Uh, uh, I don't even have a PhD in physics. Uh, I'm an economist by training. Um, I, I did start on a PhD in econometrics. And I have a degree in philosophy, and that's actually what sort of um, inspired me to uh, to start thinking about this. You know, if you do philosophy, one of the uh, sub-disciplines, I would say, of philosophy is uh, epistemology, huh? the science of, uh, of knowledge, huh? well, what is knowledge? And then the other one is, of course, um, a bit metaphysics, what's reality, right? Um, I, I will talk about that. Uh, I think it's... Uh, the question that makes sense and doesn't make sense depends on your definition of reality a little bit but i'll talk about that um i would like to stress that i'm not here to um to do what boltzmann uh, told us to do is that is to defend uh, you know some truth that we have found to our uh, last breath no i'm not trying to convince you of, uh, of anything i'm just presenting what makes sense to me but at the same time you know i do that in the spirit of uh, yeah um thinking about what might be true and uh, and I've written a lot of things I've written a lot of papers and I think writing helps and makes it clear so I refer there to my research gate page and um, you can look at about the uh, you know the, the, the 40 papers there's about 10 of these are I think fairly accessible the other ones are maybe very complicated and more tentative um, what I don't do is sort of to continue what uh, Ehrenfest um, called uh, their uh, unendliche Heisenberg born Dirac Schrödinger Wurstmaschine Physik Betrieb. So um, he committed suicide. He was um, he was not happy with this sort of uh, mystery interpretation, uh, which is the mainstream interpretation. What is this wave function? Uh, there's no clear answer to that. Um, so, so my interpretation of, uh, of quantum mechanics is, is quite realist, actually goes back to um, De Breuil and, uh, and Einstein. I think Einstein got a bit tired of discussing with Bohr. 
so um, maybe in my work uh, I bring um, some good elements that were there um, back to um, back to the front stage I hope um, so um, let us get started um, yeah, I just want to say one more thing, perhaps another thing that um, um, sort of explains my arrogance, I would say, is that, uh, in, you know, scientists uh, that are out there and, and claim to, you know, have, um, you know, that they know what it's about and that, you know, an amateur like, like me or like you cannot find out things for themselves that they don't really understand, that they don't know what it's about. Um, I think that's the arrogance. It's not a, our arrogance of sort of asking like, you know, what do you really mean? What, what, what are you talking about? Why would it be so that, you know, this this knowledge about um, what is real, not real, what works in physics and, and, and what isn't? It's, it's, the, it's the king of science, uh, physics. Uh, they call math, uh, mathematics, the, the queen of science. Um, physics is the king of science and I think um, physicists, academics don't don't do themselves much of a favor uh, you know when they continue to talk about um, you know in their ivory tower about models that no one else can understand uh, and and sort of refuse to explain um, what, what it's all about. Um, I'm, I'm pretty shocked actually because in the last years what you see is that um, people uh, are asking more for, uh, you know, scientists to explain what they are about. And, and, and one or two or three scientists um, have not done science a great favor by joining ventures that um, are, are less than uh, intellectually honest, I would say. I'm thinking here of, um, for instance, Dr. John Clauser, Nobel Prize uh, in Physics 2022, who sort of um, turns into a... Uh, uh, a climate change denier. Um, I, I think you can dispute about the, the science behind climate change. Uh, there, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, that's open to everyone. Are these models right? Um, how can they be tuned? Um, but sort of, uh, you know, a scientist that, that says, uh, you know, climate change is not happening while you have a measurable uh, change in, in the temperature on Earth and, and a clear correlation between that and um, and and the rise in uh, uh, CO2 emissions and other greenhouse house gases, you know, there there you go, like uh, man, you know, you, you should they, they should strip you of your Nobel Prize, and um, and I'm thinking also here at Hoft, you know, he 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 associated himself with his Mars One uh, venture. Uh, which which got um, you know we would be, put people and create a colony on Mars. This is the scientific basis and the, the, the technology that you need for that and the whole objective of that thing. Um, you know it resulted after one or two decades in a, a lot of investors losing their money in the venture and uh, you know the whole business got wrapped up and it's sad because Gerhard Hoft is 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 again also a Nobel Prize winner in physics. And then you think like, um, you know, you doubt me as an amateur physicist uh, that my logic is not right, that I'm, I'm trying to sell like uh, in numerological models. Um, I, I got that criticism. Um, but it sort of emboldens me also to say like, you know, um, who are you to, to tell me that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not as smart as you are. Um, so um, let's get started with because I talked 10 minutes and it's uh, not very rational what I've been saying right now. Um, but it's, uh, as I would say, it's a bit of an introduction to, to my science of philosophy then, or philosophy of science. So philosophy, um, well, when you talk about epistemology, you know, what is knowledge, what can we know combined with a bit of metaphysics. Uh, what is real, what is not real. Um, I've studied like Kant. Um, you, you know, um, at the end of the 19th century, there was a lot of interest in uh, the theory of language because I, I do believe that indeed uh, our language, and I include mathematical language, um, yeah, that, that's sort of our window. Oh, that's the, uh, the lens 
we use to explain the world, right? Um, so, so I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, personally, I'm, um, I like Wittgenstein, but that's a complicated guy. Um, so, so let's say about language, actually, I thought, um, you know, Ferdinand de Saussure, he's, he's a bit forgotten. He had a, a semantic uh, theory about semantics or semiotics. Semantics is the, is the, is the philosophy of, um, of, uh, of language, meaning semiotics is the, is the philosophy of, of science, you know, limits itself to, you know, the, the meaning of science, um, traffic signs, <laughs> letters, symbols. So you combined, yeah, you could say that's a theory of meaning, right? And um, Ferdinand Saussure's theory was, I think everybody says that it was based on a duality. Uh, I think it was more subtle than that. He said, basically, you have a symbol. Huh? Think of a, a psi or a phi symbol or a delta or a, a letter. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, so you have that sign itself, right? Uh, the signifier and uh, in French le, le signifiant, and then you have the meaning of the sign, um, the signified thing or le signifié. I think it sounds better in uh, in French. The Saussure was a Swiss a Swiss language theorist. I, I think in his um, um, writings he makes it abundantly clear that uh, you know the meaning of the sign uh, is not exactly the same as you know the, the thing that it names which in modern language theory is known as the referent well, the thing it, it refers to and the other the other thing as a question or remark is the Saussure was definitely a, a, a structuralist he says uh, signs or symbols they only make sense as part of a of a system of symbols and then you can argue is that a, is that a closed system or 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 is there ambiguity there um what are the relations between those symbols and whatever but it, it's definitely a system um, uh, not a mathematical system but a system um and that's where i, I jot down some um some equations there which which make that clear c uh, in, in physics that's the velocity of of light so it's a magnitude uh, we can write it as a, you know if you think of a of speed then you know then you think of velocity velocity is a vector so we can think of c and bolt phase as a velocity vector and you can say okay something moves through space in, in a linear way follows a linear trajectory or it goes around and around and around so we have an orbital um, um, velocity so you you expand these symbols and and everyone understands that in physics at least um, what i'm writing here so uh, if i write um, the magnitude of C as the um, the magnitude of an orbital uh, velocity vector C, then you know I can um, rewrite it as the product of a radius vector and an axial vector, uh, an orbital frequency vector omega, and then uh, you know I can calculate that because the radius vector and this axial vector polar vector um, will be perpendicular to each other. So the magnitude, that cross product, that vector, the magnitude of the vector cross product will be equal to, you know, to other magnitudes, the, the radius itself and the orbital frequency vector. And that's actually my particle model. And I write another one there, uh, ESMC square. Everybody says, well, you can't understand that. What, what is Einstein's energy, a mass equivalence relation? What kind of equivalence is there? Well, there's a there's a number of um, of things about it. For me, it's it's quite clear that uh, again, if you if you think about energy, energy is a force over a distance, and uh, so you can think of some kind of oscillation that um, and I think of particles as as oscillations of a charge, uh, and there's a force on that charge, and uh, and if you think of a two dimensional oscillation. Um, you know, the charge goes up and down and it goes sideways, you know, it will end up going, you know, around and around. And um, if we sort of say like that's a charge without any other attributes, um, has no mass of its own, uh, it acquires an energy because that force is working on it and uh, it's working over a distance. So that's where the energy then comes from. And so that whole thing in itself will acquire an energy where basically you know at, at the basis of it you you you, you don't need the mass concept 
Um, the mass concept pops up when you say like, okay, I want to move this, this thing. Uh, and I'm thinking of an electron and a proton here as a, as a charged oscillation. You know, I want to accelerate the electron or the proton as a whole and, you know, give it some acceleration so that it uh, you know, spins around an electron around the proton. So we have a hydrogen atom or, or we move the whole atom um, uh, in a certain direction. We accelerate it in an accelerator. Then you then you can say okay it, it will acquire some uh, relativistic mass and then that's then what what uh, what what that equivalence is is about um, uh, the relativistic mass will be what well it's um, it's actually still Newt Newton's interpretation the, um, the the mass factor in the um, the force is, is the mass times the the acceleration is actually the the inertia to uh, change in the state of motion of, of, of what? Well, when you talk about elementary particles, the, the state of motion of a point-like charge. And, um, and so that, that point-like charge is, it's, uh, is wrapped up in its own oscillation, uh, according to the, the Planck-Einstein law. And so, um, yeah, you, you, you will need another, you, you will need a force to accelerate it. And, and the mass factor, that's where the equivalence is, is basically the, the inertia to a change in the state of motion of that blob of energy, uh, I would say. And that's where sort of the ESMC square uh, relation, when, when I look at it and uh, said C square for me, uh, you know, I, I rewrite it as the product of um, some kind of radius vector and uh, a cross product and, and, and an orbital frequency vector. Uh, and, and so the, the, the magnitude is equal to um, A square times um, omega square. You know, that's where I can see, yeah, that makes sense because that's the uh, equation for um, an oscillator. The energy in an oscillation is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the oscillation and it's also proportional to the square of the frequency of that oscillation. And it doesn't matter if it's a linear um, oscillation or, uh, you know, a combination of uh, two linear oscillations, which is, you know, that GIF file there, um, you know, I can, I, if, if I have two oscillations that are perpendicular to each other, you know, I said the, the, the end result will be like um, that, 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 that thing goes round and round and round and I can make uh, like a star engine with three pistons or, uh, you know, that's the metaphor I use or, or with five or four or eight or, or whatever. The, the, the thing is you have this um, this thing going round and round and round and you can think of it as being driven by um, you know linear uh, linear oscillator you will say where does the force come from and this is the funny thing when this is where it's only a metaphor is that uh, you know a charge um, going round and round and round is a ring current so it will generate an electromagnetic field a magnetic field basically and um, and that's also what it makes it uh, go round and round and round. There, there's a there's a fine tuning problem there. You know, the slightest disturbance in that thing, you know, would, would make the charge go off track and whatever. But but that's what that's what it is. Um, and and you see when a photon hits an electron, yeah, there is a temporary disturbance. But then you know the photon, a new photon gets ejected. That's what I think it happens. And um, the equilibrium situation of the electron, maybe with some extra linear kinetic energy you know as it bounces from from the collision with the photon it bounces back and uh, but the photon will have a different energy and all these things um, make sense so the, the other formula i i write there is uh, you know i talked about the electron um you know we we can drive all kinds of physical um, qualities that we can measure measurable qualities the radius uh, here i do it for the proton uh, uses somewhat modified uh, Planck-Einstein relationship, which um, uh, the energy is four times. And I write there also h bar as a vector. You know, if we think of Planck's quantum of action, its dimension is angular momentum. So why not write it as a as angular momentum, which means it's a vector quantity. It has some direction. It's a it's a polar vector as well, an actual vector, a pseudo vector, but it's it's real. With a with another um, uh, pseudo vector, the orbital frequency vector, and um, you know the, these equations to me make sense, and I write them out, and uh, you know I've produced like um, dozens of pages that sort of show that this model generates, you know, the magnetic moment that we are measuring uh, from experiments. It confirms the measurements that were made in the proton radius experiments of, of JLab. Um, so. Um, 
So yeah, for me, this is all very real. And so this language, these equations that you have there um, are symbols, so symbols uh, that make sense as part of a, a system of symbols, uh, equations, um, um, all these mathematical operators, uh, rotation operators, or squaring something, or making a, you know, a vector cross product. Um, so yeah, for me, um, I think the Saussure's theory of meaning um, pretty much applies, and uh, I don't, I don't see how we can refine it further. Um, those philosophers amongst us will immediately say, well, the Saussure, whoa, that's old, that's old school. Um, there's a review here of a Dutch guy, Jan Koster. Uh, I think it comes from a book in 1996. I saw it uh, in, the, in the Wikipedia article on the Saussure. He said, uh, as a result of the Chomsky revolution, linguistics has gone through a number of conceptual transformations which have led to all kinds of technical uh, preoccupations that are far beyond the linguistic practice of the days of Saussure. For the most, it seems Saussure has rightly sunk into near oblivion. Um, most people would also say like um, Kant, uh, the great uh, philosopher who, who, who thought of space and time as some kind of category of the mind. You know, uh, his theory also isn't, isn't valid anymore because we have relativity theory and all that. I, I think it's very valid. It's just time and space. They are categories of the mind, but I will talk about it. It's quite logical that we, you know, we need to tune our concepts a little bit when, when we talk about motion. Um, and, and, and relativity theory comes quite naturally um, for me out, out of the such considerations. So I think the Saussure with, with some... Uh, uh some some um remarks on the side like indeed saying like hey I remember he was a structuralist uh, and it's i uh, will talk about wittgenstein in a moment which wittgenstein said the same thing he in, in, in his book tractatus logico philosophicus he said like you know we can have a, a system of signs that are that uh, had the word in which there is no ambiguity in their meaning i think the ambiguity will always be there i said uh, esmc square um wh when i look at that equation i see an oscillator an oscillator model and um, I think of mass as uh, uh, not being the essence of reality charges for me so you will always have that ambiguity on, on sort of interpreting these things but to Saussure basically his theory of meaning or, or reality I would say is uh, is fine for me we have symbols and they make up a system of symbols uh, I think in physics and this is the beauty about physics it, it's a closed system of symbols. We, we, we have all the equations. Um, they all make sense. I think the revision of the of the system of uh, SI units in 2018-19 sort of um, is pretty much the model. We know all. Uh, I did another video on, uh, on the end of physics, as I call it, as a science. There's plenty of engineering left and, and plenty of, uh, you know, uh, we need to work out like a model for the neutron, for example, or, or a deuteron model. So there's plenty of work left in terms of, um, you know, modeling, uh, uh, I would say, systems of, uh, of electrons and protons or, 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 an, or a neutron. What is a neutron? For me, it's a, uh, it's a neutral current, you know, because we have a positive and a negative charge and it acts as a sort of glue uh, holding protons together, which otherwise would be repelled by enormous forces. Um, so uh, wh why do I say so? Because if you take a neutron outside of the uh, of a nucleus, a uh, free, free neutron, uh, it, it is quite stable. But um, you know, after 15 minutes, it will have disintegrated into um, an electron and a proton. So the, it, it can't be a fundamental particle. For me, the idea of a particle, and this is something that is sloppily defined, is uh, uh, electrons, protons. Yes, they are matter particles because they are stable. Um, uh, things that are unstable, um, that have no unity as such. Um, uh, we should probably call them, um, I don't know what, uh, disequilibrium situations or uh, temporary oscillations of charge or, um, or when they're very short-lived, like uh, resonances. Huh? So um, all these things, bosons, fermions, particles, you know, these, these, are, um, these, these are not the real thing in physics. Huh? The, the real thing in physics is, is these equations. Um, 
I think this is going to be my worst lecture ever because we're 15 minutes into the game and I I feel like probably uh, that I'm, I'm uh, I, I might not be very convincing. So let me um, let me move on to the to the next slide. Uh, I think I will talk about Wittgenstein there, or maybe not yet. Um, let's see. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to sort of, um, uh, probably because I knew I would be talking um, uh, very philosophically, br bring down a few um, uh, things down to earth by um, some jokes. And they're, they're, not, so, they're not jokes. They're, they're, they're rather metaphors that may help you um, to understand why I think um, uh, my my realist interpretation based on you know particles being charged oscillations makes sense. One of them is this this mystery in uh, in quantum physics. You know that uh, it's a paradox. Uh, you know you have a a, a potential wall huh? in space, um, some electromagnetic field, uh, that is whose, whose magnitude, direction, whatever uh, is a barrier to a charged particle that has some um, kinetic energy. Um, but the energy is not enough to sort of go through that um, barrier, so, or charge. So the, the, the thing is, is how, how, how does this happen then? You know, this, this particle doesn't have enough energy to, to get out of a potential well. Huh? We have the two potential walls well, on every side. And, and this particle does get out from time to time. Um, it's quantum tunneling, right? My, my theory there is, uh, and that comes out of, of these, uh, of these, these that, that dynamic view, I would say, of, of what particles are, um, and also the fields they generate, is that, you know, this is not a wall like a brick wall. Um, it, it's a kind of a strange wall where, um, you know, holes appear and, and, and disappear. Uh, I have a very dynamic view and um, whole averages, yes, will indicate that the energy is something, uh, you know, is much higher than the, the kinetic energy of that particle that, that tunnels through at some moment. Um, but, but you can think of things bouncing around and it's like, um, well, what, 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 the metaphor is really like, we, we have a propeller, right? And um, if you shoot bullets through it, you know, some of the bullets, uh, depending on the velocity of the bullet, the speed of the propeller and whatever will, will you know, will hit the propeller and if it's, uh, think of a very strong propeller and that you can't destroy, not like in World War One, uh, they, they will bounce back from that propeller, right? So that, that's where, you know, you hit a potential wall and uh, you don't get through. But, uh, you know, if, 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 if the time and... Uh, position of that particle happened to be in between two propeller braids, you know, it will get through and hopefully it will not kill uh, the nice uh, Christmas guy there. But, but that's how you should think about these uh, dynamics. Um, uh, and this is why I think uh, my, my theory does make sense. We have a very static um, interpretation of quantum mechanics based on what I will talk about, you know, we, uh, the, the Bray's um, matter wave, we, we, there is a frequency. Protons, electrons have a frequency, but it's an orbital frequency, not something linear. Um, there's statistical uh, indeterminism uh, or determinism, I would, I would call it. It whizzes around at speed of light. Uh, we don't know the initial conditions, but, uh, you know, it's not a static thing. It's not a, a blob of charge, a smeared out charge. No, the charge at, at, at each, the point like charge inside of a proton or an electron at, at, at every point in time, it is somewhere here or there, or somewhere in between, but it, it's somewhere. And um, I quoted that in other videos, you know, Feynman does say that very regularly in his lectures. And at the same time, when he gets into, you know, modeling it with wave functions and whatever, it becomes like this, um, this continuous uh, mess, I would say. So, um, so, so that's uh, uh, on a lighter note, um, illustrating what, what, what I think, um, we are looking at uh, when we look at these these physical equations they do describe something uh wave functions that are modeling you know a, a potential well um that are modeling uh, particles uh, we are talking about something very specific and, and you can compare it to this um, christmas plane um, on time and space, yeah, on time and space, I think uh, I should do a better job at uh, talking about that because I actually 
prepared a little note where um, at the beginning of, of a manuscript I published. Um, you know, this was one of the first things that, that struck me when, when I listened to Feynman's uh, uh, lectures on, on, on video where he sort of in, in QCD, sorry, in QED, quantum electrodynamics, talks about, you know, um, a positron, an anti electron as, a, you know, this is something like that goes backwards in time. Uh, well, uh, yes, from a mathematical point of view, but uh, it's because you model it as a, as a spin zero particle and this and that. So the direction of, a, of, 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 of its spin, uh, of the drink current, you know, goes here or it goes there. And for an electron and a positron, this is opposite. So this, this sign, um, the plus or minus sign um, in, in front of the, um, of the wave function that describes an electron or, or, or a positron, you know, that does not depend on your convention. That this is something that struck me also when I did an EDX course. It's like, well, you know, we can phrase quantum mechanics in terms of a, a plus uh, Euler's numbered with with the, uh, the the phase argument multiplied by the imaginary unit i'm going to know we're, we're talking here really about rotations and, and so there's direction of that and uh, an electron and a positron you know we swap the charges so it means you swap the signs uh, it, it has nothing to do with you know um, things going possibly uh, or in reality uh, backwards in time why, why am i saying that this is sort of a revised version of um, you know uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, uh, theory of, 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 of space and time, or which actually goes back to to Hume, um, David Hume. Yeah, it's a it's a category of our mind. You know, we, we live in three D space, and so we we everything that that happens, um, we imagine it in three D space. Why? Because we live in a three-dimensional space and time is very real we get older we die you know it's uh, we see uh, things disintegrating uh, there's entropy there's uh, you know time it goes one direction only and so in in physics you have these um, these uh, you know in quantum physics these brilliant models you know like a perpetuum mobile you know the charge goes round and round and round and round, and round. so um, do we reverse time for that no why not um, because for time, you know, to define time, um, time actually comes with the, uh, and, and space, comes a bit with the idea of motion uh, for me. So if, if, if you, it's a bit of a refinement of Hume's and Kant's theory. They, they said, you know, time and space, they are categories of the mind. I'm going like, you know, everything we, um, we understand is based on the idea of motion. Uh, so that goes back to the Greeks, Peter. Um, uh, you know, um, the Greeks were in this eternal discussion: uh, is the universe static or dynamic? Uh, I think it's rather obvious that it's dynamic. Um, pantare, everything flows, everything moves, everything changes. So um, if you if you look at that, um, you know, a charge that that goes around or or moves or a particle or a planet that that, that orbits is um, you you are basically modeling that motion in your mind. And how do you do that mathematically? Well, you do that with a, a, a function, right? You you're gonna relate the position x. Uh, to uh, uh, the position in space here is one dimensional space and uh, x axis, but you're going to have an x, y, z coordinate uh, or 3D space. And you're going to, you are, you are going to ask yourself, okay, what at each point in, in time, where, where is that thing? And so then, um, you know, you have two possibilities. Either you have uh, this, this red curve, which is not a function. Uh, and which doesn't make sense at all. Um, you, you see this sort of spaghetti thing um, implies that, um, you know, at, at, at one point in time, this particle can be at th three uh, separate points at the same time. You, you go in the beginning, it's nice, you know, we have one position for, for, for each time t, but then suddenly, you know, this thing moves backwards and the curve crosses itself, which basically means uh, uh, the, yeah, uh, when you go back in time, you allow something to happen that is not logical. You allow a, a particle to go to another position at the same point in time. So you don't have a function there. Uh, the, the green thing uh, on the right hand side, that is a function for each point in time we have one position x 
and it can be i mean that this is a pretty random motion um, that I, I have there you know you see uh, the thing um this this uh, this object accelerates and then you know goes away from its starting point zero to some point um uh, some maximum there and then you know it uh, decelerates and uh, stops and uh, and uh, it goes back to a point where it had been before in time and then uh, you know it gets there and then uh, you know it moves away again and it's, so you, you see these very wild swings in uh, in this green curve but that's something that um, probably does not correspond to any physical situation but logically it is possible and it respects the principle that when you model motion our mind um, works with with functions uh, when it comes to, um, uh, to to physical situations, and uh, and that's that's really where um, our concept of time, um, you know, it it uh, it's something that goes in one direction only and can only go in one direction. We 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 must have well-behaved functions for trajectories for motion. So it's the idea of motion that, that gives space and time their meaning for me in physics. Uh, the, the alternative idea is, um, is, uh, is spaghetti. Uh, that's the first graph and uh, you can't do anything with that. You, you, you can't just can't do anything. With the green thing, yeah, it's complicated. The, the force, think of this modeling indeed a point like charge. Um, the force that makes it do what it does um, uh, in this green curve is a uh, is a very wild oscillation but it is um it is theoretically or i wouldn't say theoretically but but logically uh, at least um possible so um i'm not gonna say more on that uh the the other thing is though that um uh, why am i giving you my definition of of what space and time really is and and why am i emphasizing that yeah, when everything is said and done, um, time and space are categories of the mind for me. Uh, we will make the, uh, the, the, the corrections for, for um, relativity theory in a moment. Um, also on a sort of, uh, you know, intuit based on an intuitive argument, uh, not Einstein's original article of 1905. But the, um, uh, I'm saying it because a lot of people that, uh, you know, some people at least, uh, you know, they, they and modern quantum theories also, you know, these uh, string theorists and, and whatever. My, my feeling is that there is a remnant of a ether uh, uh, theory left. Huh? You know, ether theory was sort of um, done away with at the end of the 19th century, where, you know, initially Maxwell also, you know, was very confused about that. He said, I've got my equations here for the electromagnetic force. Um, you know, what what is it? that uh, what are these fields so what is oscillating well a field is a um, is a field you should think of it as a, you know force always acts on something huh? um well if you sort of make abstraction of, a, of 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 the thing it acts on a force acts on a charge i think there's only the electromagnetic force a nuclear force we can talk about that um, but it, 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 it's all electromagnetic it acts on a, on a charge uh, if we make abstraction of the charge then you have something in space and in time, uh, uh, dynamic fields, that uh, when you put a charge there, you know, it will um, it will uh, create a force. But space and time itself is, you know, we don't need to model it in terms of some elasticity or, uh, or uh, and, and this is the um, the main change also, you know, I thought about these things like for five or 10 years and, and where I feel my oscillator model may have given you the impression that I, I do think in terms of, uh, you know some kind of elasticity of space-time uh, that makes this oscillation going uh, and I, I write as much in, in, in a paper I, I will call the paper that got the, the most reads is that I think like oh well maybe we should go beyond electromagnetic theory and uh, you know the, the, this oscillator model it's so it's so nice but um, you know it's just like there is a force but there is no real force it's electromagnetics explains it the charge goes around creates the electromagnetic field that makes it go around and, and so we have that perpetual model, mo uh, mobile um, that defines an electron and a proton. We don't need to define um, the model in terms of some kind of uh, ether or elasticity of space time or, uh, or other things. Um, 
this is just then um, you know for the the people who are a bit new to the math um, and and who sort of or, or don't want to go into the math uh, uh, I talk about this oscillator model you see there this uh, this comes from Wikipedia um, the, the the phase uh, of a wave function um, you know that's an angle Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, I'll, I'll give you the formula for that uh, in a moment. Um, so we have this angle. Huh? Uh, think of it as the argument of the wave function. Uh, it goes round and round and round. And so the wave function as a whole basically models the um, position, the motion of, of what I think of as a point like charge in the, in the electron. So you can really see here, like uh, think of this as a ring current. Um, the green dot goes around, that's the point like charge. It has some um, dimension of its own. I talked about it in the previous um, videos, we, we can measure that. It's alpha times the electron radius as a whole. It explains the anomaly in the magnetic moment. But, but again, uh, the oscillator is that, yeah, we, we, can, we can think of this as a, as a, as a combined, um, uh, as a combination of two linear oscillations, one which is modeled by a cosine function, uh, the cosine of the, the phase, and the other one, the sine. And, uh, and here also always remember the sine and the cosine are, are the same function, same cyclical function, except for a, you know, a phase difference, uh, which is linked to the geometry of that thing, uh, of, of 90 degrees. And, uh, and once you sort of um, understand this, this is a nice uh, oscillation. Uh, I, I love this, uh, this animation. Um, then, you know, uh, symbols like sine, cosines, uh, you know, squaring uh, uh, to get a magnitude um, or a probability uh, of, 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 uh, of, um, of something, be a wave function of, uh, you know, in the position space or um, uh, then, then uh, you know, that falls into place. So, you, you, you yeah, stare at these things, uh, try to imagine them. Um, once you get this, sort of try to imagine how this, this ring current itself, you know, can oscillate and uh, can turn around its own axis. So then we can add another uh, imaginary unit as a rotation operator. And, you know, that's an oscillation in itself. And uh, we can think of a three-dimensional oscillation. This is another problem with this um, propeller or star engine model. Um, you know, we can imagine it in two dimensions very easily because we, we have airplanes that use star engines. Um, uh, star engine in three dimensions. <laughs> that, yeah, that's something we can't build. But in nature, we have it. I think the the, the, the proton is like a sort of a three dimensional star engine, um, if you want. Um, yeah, here I have that star engine. Eh? Um, so that models the electron perfectly. Uh, I said, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if we think of two linear oscillations or three or five, what we will have is, is some kind of combination of, um, if we have more uh, linear oscillations of a, of a cosine and a sine function and, uh, and a phase uh, in, in these functions that combine the sine and a cosine um, with a difference of 10 degrees or 15 degrees or 45 degrees, depending on how many pistons uh, or how many oscillations you, you, you think you, you want to model. Um, in the end, the model, um, for me is like, um, is, is, is didactic, uh, the oscillator model. Uh, you should really imagine, um, um, according to me, sort of, a, you know, an, an infinite number of pistons, so to speak. Uh, and then the, uh, the force somehow also, um, you know, is then goes to zero for each of the, uh, of the linear directions. Um, but that, that's, uh, that's what you should think of. Um, it's the first time I'm explaining these things in such an uh, intuitive, um, philosophical way, so I may not have done the, the, the best job at it, but, uh, you know, time and energy is limited in a man's life. And in mine, I have a different day job, so I'll, um, I'll move on and maybe you can do a better job um, by thinking about all of this and, um, and tuning it. This is nice. I, uh, I got a lot of criticism on um, um, I got criticism on, on sort of the, the, the lack of uh, professionality in my videos. The sound is not good. Uh, the slides are static. Um, yeah, I'm not a professional. Uh, 
academic and so um, yeah my time and energy are limited what i want to do here is actually do uh, so i played with that i want to um, walk you through uh, relativity theory basically and and tell you why a mass uh, think of it as as an inertia to change uh, in the state of motion of what is basically a charged oscillation uh, and i'm going to show you that by by telling you like a a uh, story um, about about how it how it makes sense. Um, it's a story I put in my in my manuscript. Um, let me let me read it out. Uh, but first, uh, before I, I start reading, is um, there you have Newton's law. Huh? So we have a force. Huh? It's a vector. A force is always in in some direction. And uh, Newton defined force, force as the product of a, you know, a mass. Huh? Uh, that's a number, huh? just a number, a scalar thing, times uh, an acceleration vector. So um, that also holds for um, you know the for linear force or, or a, uh, uh, say an orbital, um, um, you know, centripetal force. Uh, centripetal force, I would say, you have an acceleration vector. So that acceleration vector can also be just like the force, either it's linear or it can be centripetal uh, acceleration vector. But what we have there is that, uh, yeah, m times uh, uh, a, uh, a vector is, you know, proportional to uh, the acceleration vector and the factor of proportionality is this mass. That's why I'm talking, I mean, I'm phrasing it very carefully like this, you know, to think of mass as, as a bit of a, a proportionality factor in this in Newton's equation. That will help. This um, this equation, when you write it out, um, you know, the, 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 the proportionality factor M, the mass, is uh, in Newton's theory before relativity came there, Galilean relativity it's also called, or Newtonian relativity. Uh, mass is a constant, and that's because we think on the macro scale, we, we don't think of charges. Uh, we actually, when we write this, the, the force is, a, is the mass times an acceleration vector. We're not thinking about, you know, what is the nature of this force? Is it electromagnetic? Is it gravitational? No, it, it goes for, for any force. It's the definition of force. We don't care what the force is. So my theory is that in the end, you know, the force is electromagnetic. What about gravitational and gravitation? That's, an, that's a different beast. Uh, there I'm with Einstein who, who says you know there you need to think about geometry of space perhaps and uh, you can you can model it as a pseudo force but I, I, I won't go into that um, um, I'll, I'll just sort of um, explain what is there so the, the acceleration vector what, what is the acceleration vector well that's the uh, um, that's the the time uh, derivative of the velocity vector uh, so it's the, 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 the derivative of the velocity vector uh, with, with regard to time t. So what's velocity? Well, we know that velocity is, you know, that, that sort of the time rate change um, of the position vector x. And so basically this is then the Newtonian um, reduction, I would say, of, of Newton's force law, which basically says, you know, the uh, force, you need to sort of take the, the second order derivative of the position vector uh, in regard to, with regard to time. And then you will see that uh, this uh, acceleration vector, that's what it is. But that quantity there, uh, d squared of x uh, over dt squared, is proportional to the mass and mass is a constant in Newtonian physics um, logical so many people have sort of really difficulty with this this concept of um, mass not being constant mass changing and you know and time delay dilation and, and relative I, I don't have any difficulty with, with, with that at all actually for me it's, it's very intuitive and um, so I wrote that out and uh, I'm going to read it for you. Uh, it's a bit of a joking story. But this is sort of uh, what, what this equation, Newton, Newton's force law, uh, implies. You know, if you apply a force uh, long enough uh, on, on some object with, with some mass, then you know you, you can accelerate it and you keep accelerating it and its velocity will go to infinity. 
and um, and you think that the universe has been around for billions of years and and uh, you know indeed objects they go from here to there and whatever but um, in reality you know free space is space is not free there's electromagnetic fields and so um, you know objects travel through it and and charges and this and that so you you can imagine that for billions of years uh, forces have been acting on you know particles and dust and charges and and whatever it is you go like well their velocity should somehow you know there is a constant acceleration on these objects their their trajectory might not be linear but um you know if, if force acts on an object you know and, and it acts long enough you know it will approach speeds speeds that um that are infinite i'm not talking about light speed but but it's infinite this equation implies that you can have uh, infinite velocities and that you can accelerate objects to um, you know infinite speed and that doesn't make much sense for me logically because you know an object with with uh, with uh, an infinite speed um you know that's everywhere and nowhere at the same time if its velocity its speed is uh, is infinity the mathematical uh definition of infinity you know infinitely fast then it means you know it's here but the next moment it, it's there it's 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 at the other end of the universe so it's it's everywhere the concept of infinite speed makes sense uh, mathematically we can use it in equations and whatever but in in reality and in, in physics it doesn't make change in, in our universe it doesn't make sense so I, i've got this this story and I'll, I'll read it out so um force would indeed be able to sort of accelerate an object any object to to an infinite speed um, it would take some time especially if it's a big mass but um it would accelerate to an infinite speed now infinity i said that it's a very nice mathematical concept but in reality it's a, it's a very weird thing so um again you know if, if objects are around long enough I'm, I'm reading all kinds of forces might cause all of these objects to to reach an infinite speed and that would be very inconvenient i'm speaking a bit like you know god building a universe here that that would not be that would not work so um we must and this is where relativity theory comes to me as being very natural uh you know th th think you're god and you're designing a universe and, and the laws of physics um so you you realize that this formula newton's formula um looks good but but doesn't make sense you know uh, when you think about um what it implies in the long run so you um you say like well we this there must be some i call it the speed cap it's like uh, cars you know uh, we cannot have cars that go infinitely fast so there must be we must cap their speed and we must cap the speed of all objects uh, cars trucks lorries um, motorbikes uh, bicycles uh, we must put a speed cap and um, they cannot go infinitely fast uh, Maseratis or forts or whatever uh, they must have some maximum speed and so um, this is then the other thing you think about matter matter particles uh, and about matter and objects uh, at the same time you know you're working uh, in the kitchen on something else you work on on light so you have you you have these photons and for some reason already you know these photons are, are are very special they always travel at uh, well the speed of light you you you've designed light radiation and you're, you're finished with that project and then there you go so we have light and it consists of photons i won't go into my photon model but that's really like a point like you know electromagnetic traveling field you know point like very small uh it it, it, it it has a linear trajectory it's always somewhere at some point in time but it travels at the speed of light and so uh, it has no rest mass huh? that comes out of your kitchen uh, work so now you're in the living room and you say like okay i'm going to design matter particles electrons and protons and all that but um they they should not go faster than the speed of light that's the speed cap i've got one in you know an obvious candidate for the for the the, the speed cap on anything uh it cannot go faster than uh, our photons you, know, you cannot have a proton or an electron or a matter or a planet you know traveling faster than um, a photon 
because a photon is really the fastest thing in the universe now. You know, uh, light is there. Huh? In the beginning, there was light, and then, as they said in the Bible, in the beginning there was light. So we have that light, and we know what it is, and um, and it travels at the speed of light. And uh, so, so now that must be. Now we must uh, design um, uh, cars and, and objects and uh, electrons and protons uh, that uh, you know travel at some fraction of the speed of light and maximum, um, you know, the speed of light itself. So um, let's think in terms of fractions: uh, the velocity of the object divided by light speed v um, uh, divided by c. So that's just a ratio of. Um, of zero and one. So um, yeah, that's the thing. So the, the this linear, um, the linearity uh, that you can accelerate objects till uh, they reach uh, infinite speed, uh, that can't work. So we need something like this. Uh, it's just a, a, a model, eh? So uh, uh, we we gonna yeah, you know, you're God. You can't you can't police the universe and eh? you need to build some mechanism right uh, that, that, that that puts um, sort of a friction device or what i don't know what you want to call it but you want to make sure and this is where the exponential that that's something that is logical um you know the the the, the, the friction will will go up um, progressively uh, from zero to one and that's actually the, the Lorentz factor i'm putting in there so in the beginning you know acceleration you know from zero to one thousand kilometer per second uh to uh, 2000 but you know it needs to stop at about the uh, what is it, 300,000 meters uh, per second so uh you will want a formula that uh you know sort of building into your laws of physics that uh, that does just that that um so uh, what's was the mechanical well, the uh, increase the mass you know if the mass goes up uh with speed then um you know, you will have to apply increasingly uh, larger forces or a larger force to give it uh, the same acceleration. In the beginning, you can accelerate something easily. You know, you give it like a one meter uh, per um, uh, second squared and uh, one meter per second per second. And uh, it will accelerate uh, w w with that amount. So the force you need then for that, you know, for a heavy thing, uh, it will give it a little acceleration for a thing that is very light, like an electron or a proton it will give it a big acceleration. Uh, but in the end, and this is sort of the green and the blue and the red curve, is, um, you know, you, you, you want a formula that can deal with, with everything. And that's where, uh, yeah, this... The, you, you want to apply it to a mass and you will differentiate it also. Uh, you will want to make sure that uh, there is an um, extra friction factor or, or I don't know what you would call it. Uh, this, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it should cope with everything. Yeah? Electrons, bicycles, spaceships, uh, solar systems. Um, but that's sort of where you, you, you're going to have then what is what we're going to arrive at some kind of a relativistic mass formula huh? the, the, the mass is going to increase with velocity and um, and then the thing is uh, you know okay what kind of formula are we going to use so um, so let's try to sort of imagine the situation you have God here huh? thinking about this and he asks his best engineers to finalize huh? the, the laws of physics and, uh, and we all sit together and I explain what I'm explaining here. You know, I um, I want something uh, about that mass. Huh? I want a sort of a mass formula. We need to build in some law that um, um, makes make sure that nothing uh, can, gets, can travel at a speed. And we need to differentiate it. Huh? A proton, I said, a uh, photon for sure. Uh, yeah, it accelerates easily. Uh, a big lorry, a planet, a galaxy, or whatever. Um, you know, yeah, that that's gonna be a different um, um, a different formula. So um, you have Lawrence then uh, getting up, and he says, uh, "Yeah, the, the mass should go up with speed, and it should go up progressively, uh, as we see here, sort of these exponential curves." And, um, and 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 this is my formula. And uh, he says, look, the the red graph there. Uh, this is if you, that's like a you know a standardized them. 
that's like for the the mass is a, a half a half of what a half kg or a, a half electron mass or whatever the blue one is twice that you see that so that that works and the green one is for ms3 um i think i have modeled that yeah so um so you look at that formula again i said but but aren't we um, aren't we discriminating here uh, the, the the on the green thing you know we we have like uh, more aggressive breaks so to speak because it goes up uh, earlier than um, it's it's you know this the same acceleration gives a uh, less velocity than you know what we have in the, in the blue and the green graph so um, you know god is not very mathematically minded but he says you know is there something wrong here and uh, and he says, no, um, this is actually what we want. Um, the factor I have here, uh, and this is the Lorentz factor, of course, this gamma, one divided by the, the square root of one minus this relative, uh, uh, the square of the relative velocity, uh, V over C. So that's V squared divided by C squared. He says, uh, you know, that, that factor, look at it, it's the same per unit mass. Of course, it will, you know, we will have like bigger brakes on a lorry than on a bicycle, because um, the mass is larger of a, of a lorry, of a bicycle. But this Lorentz factor that I apply to calculate, you know, a new uh, eff effective mass or relativistic mass or whatever you want to call it, uh, it doesn't discriminate. Um, it's it's the same per unit mass. So this is the beauty about this thing is that uh, you know we don't uh, we have we have a formula that incorporates the the rest mass of the object m0 and then uh, we have a factor there uh, that makes it increase uh, with velocity and in that factor itself uh, you know there is no mass factor the, the zero rest mass is proportional you know the relativistic mass is proportional to uh, m0 to the rest mass uh, with that with that Lorentz factor so um, you are God, and then um, you you think, okay, that makes sense. But you say, like, hey, hey, Newton, um, you know, I said your law can't work, but uh, you know, at the same time, you know, uh, there's this planet Earth there, and they used your law to make cars and and whatever. We we can't uh, just change that law. And and Newton himself would probably say, like, uh, mm, sir, uh, God, it's um, it's not a problem. Because um, this force law that I had, a mass times uh, an acceleration vector, you know, that will give the force, uh, it doesn't change my formula. I think uh, Lorentz is a smart guy. I'm actually referring to Lorentz, who um, introduced these Lorentz formulas huh, uh, for, for time dilation and, and relativistic mass. He says uh, Lorentz is, is a good engineer because, uh, you know, he, he didn't change my formula. And uh, the only thing we need to change is that mass is no longer a constant, and uh, I'm fine with that. And uh, and then God goes like, "Hey, Galileo, uh, you know, uh, do you agree?" And yeah, Galileo says, "No, no problem whatsoever. This um, this law, this Lorentz, this new law, the Lorentz factor actually incorporates sort of, um, you know, our law. It just makes it." Um, clear that uh, you know yeah our law newton's law galileo uh, relativity uh, this um it only applies to uh, rather large objects and with rather large objects i mean like atoms molecules uh, you know things that um systems really of elementary particles but uh yeah when we go down deep 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 um where where we have uh, you know electrons and uh, electron orbitals reaching uh, some fraction of light speed then yeah we, we need this relativistic mass formula we need to admit that uh, for big masses m looks constant but actually isn't and uh, and that's why we can't accelerate them to more than 120 miles per hour or something like if we talk about a car so he says the um my law is valid and i, I agree with his proposal of Lorentz to put a brake on on things uh, on bicycle and anything so to make sure that nothing can um, you know matter uh, cannot go faster than 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 a photo than than any signal um so this this formula is, is basically correct and then uh, this is the uh, the nice circular arc i put there because you think this this formula looks looks messy yeah? one divided by you know a square root um it actually is not a messy factor. The the inverse of the uh, of the Lorentz factor is um, 
you know is what is shown there at the bottom and the it's a circular arc the the, the function you know the relation between um, the inverse Lorentz factor and the uh, relative velocity uh, beta as it's known v divided by c it's a circular arc so um you know i advise you to uh, to to read I'm, I'm already at one hour speaking um i will take a small break now um but this is what i wanted to say is that relativity theory is um is is not complicated uh, it, it, it is based on the idea of uh, you know um, infinities infinite velocities don't make sense um the formulas all work um, uh, are, are applied to mass units, um, so they're they're not discriminatory in any way. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it has implications, of course, on you know yeah how we think about time and and, and a lot of other things. And uh, I think in the first discussion, God probably didn't realize that, but that's uh, what what Einstein then uh, worked out where. Um, you know, he says we need a, a new concept of of space and time and 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 velocity itself if we start fiddling with this uh, with, with accelerations and um, uh, things becoming more and more uh, it's become more and more difficult to accelerate things to to larger speeds then there's this guy in god's room uh, einstein who says like you know i need to go back to the drawing table and sort of spell out what what all of this means and um so that's what uh, I end the story like that. Uh, what what God then does, He says, "Look, I've, I've, I'm, I'm tired. I'm going on leave. Uh, I, I produce these photons and light. I produce the light, and now Lorenz and Einstein can the two of you um, sit together and, and and get on with it and create, um, you know, the laws of physics, uh, matter particles that uh, that make sense somehow in this picture. So." Um, that's what we'll do in the in the next slide. Um, um, I would say, should I take a break? Yeah, probably we we should. Uh, at the same time, I, I think I'll um, I'll just go on. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll take a break. This is. Um, no, I will not take a break. The, the people ask me sometimes, you know, what, what is then the, you know, the equation of the universe, the equation of life, or or, uh, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is a funny question for me also. It's, um, you know, there's this movie about uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, and and this movie, uh, I, I don't think it's very realistic. I don't think the movie about Oppenheimer, who just came out, is is very realistic. Uh, the, these people didn't didn't think in terms of. Uh, you know the one equation of uh, of the universe. Um, Feynman makes a joke about that in his lectures, and he says, "Yeah, there, of course there is an equation for the universe." Uh, and he said, "There, there it is. U is equal to zero." And as you can see, we put it in bold face. Uh, uh, bold face U is uh, zero, but zero as a vector. Vector in what direction? You will say, "Well, no direction." You know, but uh, we put it in a vector or um, well, actually, uh, you know, not in a vector. It's actually a multi. I mean, it has more dimensions. We we this, this U. Uh, this is what Feynman then uh, sort of works out. Um, we we can put it as a vector, as a set of um, equations. Uh, you know, we have a vector where we put like you know, the relativity formula, and then the second element in, in this. Um, column vector let's say that u is a column vector is is our other is another equation uh, the planck einstein relation let's say on uh, and then uh, the next one is is the first of the four uh, maxwell's equations and three four so we have like a row vector with um we, we with equations physical equations and uh, you know we can rearrange these equations by putting you know all, all, all terms on one side and then and, and just on, on the left hand side we have zero huh? so uh, for instance e is mc square we can write that as e minus mc square is equal to zero you agree all right and the planck einstein relation is uh, e is equal to um, h bar times um, uh, omega or h times frequency huh? And we can write that as e minus uh, h times f is equal to zero. So we have a raw vector with all the physical equations 
uh, and we have another row vector, uh, sorry, column vector with zeros. Uh, so that that's already yeah. Then we have all the laws of the of the universe in in one single grand equation because we will equate that one column vector with u and the other column vector with the zero um, column vector. But the more interesting thing is. Um, is I think is just to, to, to not rewrite too much. It's say for us, okay, we have uh, this velocity formula. It's a classical Newtonian one. Um, or no, it's just a, a mathematical relation. The, the position is always equal to the velocity uh, times uh, the time. Huh? So many meters per second is the velocity times time. So the, the, the position will be there. It will have moved so much. And um, we can write this for linear. Huh? We, we can adapt it. But you can write it as a... As a, as a as a matrix equation where we have the only element that matters is a x and there in the in the top uh, left hand corner is equal to the v in the top left hand corner uh, of the first matrix on the uh, right hand side uh, times t and all the other elements in these vec in these matrices are zero and so um, that's more interesting than column vectors then i have a matrix equation and so every single law or equation uh, I have, and I said I, I will present them. There's there's not too many, uh, but I can write them as a matrix equation uh, U uh, one uh, for I don't know the Mazzei energy equivalence relation, and then U two for the Planck Einstein relation, and then U I for uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, you know I can write them as a as sort of a, you know a set of a matrix equation. So um, and then then you get there too. This is the the theory of everything. You know, uh, u1 is zero, uh, um, the zero matrix, and u2 is another zero matrix, maybe with a different dimension. Um, ui is another zero matrix. Of course, I need to make sure that, you know, the largest matrix that's going to be, uh, I know I use this weird symbol, E from Aether. Um, that's the theory of everything then. You know, I could put a gravitation there also. And, uh, and so that's, um, that's a bit of a joke, um, but this is also something I want to tell you is that uh, you, you, you'll never get like, um, um, well, you, you will get it. Uh, you, uh, Feynman calls it the unworldliness um, as a joke. Uh, I could call it W, the worldliness, uh, uh, or the U could stand for the universe is equal to uh, a zero vector or a zero matrix. Um, and that's really it. You can you can break it down in laws and, and equations, but you know compressing them, uh, it's like uh, what you can do with Maxwell's equation is uh, you you can use four vector notation to um, write them in a more compact way, and um, and with four vector notation you know you get from four equations to uh, to two equations. And then uh, you can combine it actually with, um, you know, you know, we have electric fields, magnetic fields, but, you know, it depends on, on your frame of reference what the electric field is and what the magnetic field is. So you'll probably have heard about two new quantities, the, the scalar potential and the vector potential. Uh, the scalar potential is a number. The, the, the scalar potential are three numbers um, related to electric field. And, and these are invariant quantities. And, uh, and if you combine these, you can write... Uh, the four Maxwell equations into one beautiful uh, equation. I will not show it here, but uh, yeah, when you first look at that equation, you don't understand anything of it. And yet, you know, it, it has everything, but it has everything because you know that the symbols that are being used there in the scalar potential, vector potential, and this and that, um, you, you can break it down and, and bring it back to what you do understand. And these are Maxwell's equations, um, which by the way, work on, on charge density. So this is, something i'll present in the in the next slide how how it changes when you go to um when you're not talking about charge densities anymore but you talk about point charges uh, that's where uh, the planck einstein relation comes in uh, i will make a short break you will not uh, feel it because i will just to push push the, the the pause button and i will go and smoke a cigarette and i'll be um, i'll be back with you in uh, for you 10 seconds for me uh, five seconds so that shows also the, the relativity of time so um, I press pause uh, so I'm back actually um, I, I went over my notes a little bit for this thing and there's, there's one thing it's on the previous slide 
a philosophical uh, remark I wanted to make and I forgot to make. Um, this, um, these formulas all look weird, eh? the, 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 the formulas of, the, uh, uh, of special relativity. Uh, I'm not talking about gravitation. But you, have, you do have um, um, this factor, the Lorentz factor, if you look at it, uh, this uh, square root of 1 minus uh, the relative velocity squared, v squared divided by c squared. Uh, that's the formula of a circle. Um, if you have the x and y coordinates of each and every point on a circle, the y coordinate of every point on a circle, um, let me show it here. Here, yeah, okay, here. You have a circle, right? Um, each point will have an x uh, coordinate and a y coordinate. We know that the, the sine and the cosine, okay? Um, the y for each point on that circle will be equal to the square root of 1 minus x square. The y coordinate is equal to the square root of 1 minus x square. So that Lorentz factor is um, is is linked to um, you know this idealized, idealized mathematical notion of of a circle, and um, for for me it's sort of I haven't gone through everything, um, but yeah when I think about that when I see a formula and Dirac was once asked that uh, this question well, what does it mean to understand a, a formula. And he said, uh, I understand the formula when I can see uh, the solution, when I can sort of imagine uh, what it means uh, in, in space and in time. Uh, when, I, when I sort of see the solution, uh, then I understand the equation without having worked it all out. And, and this is something where I, I, I got, and, uh, and it's something you, you should probably, um, if you're struggling with things, uh, try, try to think of that as well. Um, you will see infinities pop up, uh, run away, uh, run away electrons, as Dirac said. Uh, he wasn't happy about that. They they do disappear. Um, they they help us see the the inconsistencies in Dirac's equation. Uh, I talk about it in my papers. Um, but it's um, it, it, it is fun actually because uh, we're always caught in between these um, mathematical description. And then physical reality, and and as a whole, actually, uh, I, I would recommend you, you you think through the the paradoxes of the paradoxes, uh, plural of Zeno, uh, which are formulated in a number of ways. You have uh, Achilles, the Greek hero, uh, running very fast, but uh, and you have the tortoise, and the tortoise starts starts in advance of Achilles. So you you think like, okay, Achilles the hero, he will overtake the tortoise, but but how does it happen when you when you break down? Uh, the distance uh, between where the, the tortoise started and where he was when Achilles arrives at that point, you know, then the tortoise will have moved a little bit further. Uh, he's slower, but he will have moved. And so um, these paradoxes get easily solved. Uh, you know that uh, Leibniz uh, solved it. Uh, he was the inventor of, of differential calculus. Uh, th there's others associated with the name of differential uh, calculus, but actually Leibniz had that already, that he said, okay, the, you have that idea that you can keep splitting an interval in smaller and smaller uh, distance units uh, and time as well. But, um, you know, the, the math the differential calculus then shows that, uh, you know, at some point in time, uh, this idea of, of, of uh, infinitesimally small uh, distance and, and space, and time intervals, you know, it's not um, the idea of, 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 of these limits. That's not incompatible with the shoulders overtaking the, the tortoise. That's the nice thing about differential equation. When, when you solve them, you see, well, at some point in time, um, you know, um, that thing goes faster than the other thing, so it will overtake it. So this is, it, it's very good to think through these paradoxes. And uh, I didn't prepare this. I could talk about it. I should maybe for, for an hour or two. It's a very funny thing with the equations in physics is that uh, you, 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 you need the math, uh, these uh, ideal equations, I would say, uh, to describe reality. Um, but then the finite speed of light, as we explained it, uh, that's a very logical idea. And, and Planck's quantum of action, uh, you know, that uh, nature in the end uh, will pack uh, energy or an oscillation or the angular momentum that is in it or uh, 
you know, the, the product of, uh, I mean, uh, or linear momentum, it will obey and will be finite and um, the, the quantities, the relationship between the momentum and, and, and the distance uh, uh, or the, the energy, sorry, the energy and, 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 and time and momentum and the distance indeed, you know, in the, the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship, which is a certainty, certainty relationship. Uh, uh, it's exactly uh, Planck Einstein law is, 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 is exact. Um, that shows us that um, uh, our mathematical ideas, they are what they are, um, they, but they are somehow idealized notions uh, to describe uh, a universe that is uh, finite and, and, and discrete. Um, let's let's move on because this may not be the the best start of the, the second half of my uh, presentation um this is a let's get back to philosophy uh, so so what's reality what's uh, was the language we use um the, there i do go back to you know what, what wittgenstein said about it uh, the the welt uh, reality uh, is the Gesamtheit der Tatsache. Uh, there's no separation between, I mean, we, we are part of reality. And uh, das Ding an sich, uh, as it was so famously called in, in, in German idealism, das Ding an sich, oh, oh, it is, it's us. Uh, I'll go back to the, I'll talk about Feynman has a, has a very nice uh, 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 philosophical excursion in one of his lectures, which, which I will quote. But so you, you have this mix of, of things that are relative, uh, things that are relative, it, 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 that depend on our frame of reference, like, you know, energy and mass, I said that will depend on, you know, our, our, our relative motion towards the object uh, of which we are measuring the mass or the energy or, or a force, it will appear different in different um, frames of, of reference, uh, different frames of reference, basically ours uh, or let's say the, the universe, uh, our planet Earth, and then we have the polar star, we can establish some kind of objective uh, frame of, of reference. Uh, um, and then the frame of reference of the object itself that is, that is moving in, in our inertial um, uh, frame of reference. So we have the inertial frame of reference, basically, and then the frame of reference of the object. Uh, and then, of course, we can invent uh, reference frames in between, you know, it, have the transformations but basically think of that uh, if we look at uh, things in, in the in the frame of reference of the moving object or we look at things in in in, in our frame over the inertial frame of reference then um, they will look different but it doesn't mean that uh, mass I mean I said mass ultimately we reduce it to you know a, a point like charge that uh, in some oscillation 2d or 3d and if we look at the electron and the proton at larger scale you know the mass of an object becomes something very real huh? uh, planet uh, forces as well uh, as a time we have time dilation these are all relative it depends on the frame of reference what what measurement you will get the macro scale mass energy uh, force time uh, look the same at the micro scale yeah we need to make a distinction between and I'll show that between the frame of reference of our moving electron and, and our frame of reference. Um, but it doesn't mean that these things aren't real. Um, there are a few quantities in physics that are absolute, that do not depend on our frame of reference. Uh, the speed of light is the speed of light. <laughs> that uh, is always the speed of light. It's being defined very exactly. Uh, almost 300,000 uh, meters per second is 298 uh, point I, I don't know I don't know it by heart but it's uh, it doesn't depend on your frame of reference uh, Planck's quantum of action is is a natural constant um, always the same value the elementary charge um, always the same value and so these things are um, you know uh, anchoring I would say uh, everything uh, and anchoring these um, uh, base equations, Maxwell's equations are relativistically correct, but they combine, you know, relative things, uh, electromagnetic force, magnetic, electric, uh, Schrodinger's equation, um, you know, the, the, the Breuse wavelength, I will talk about that, and that's the usual representation of, of the, the matter wave, huh? uh, some, some wavelength is equal to, and I write it in vector notation, um, Planck's quantum of action divided by the momentum. But what is that momentum? Um, is it linear really? Is it a mass moving at linear velocity or are we thinking of an orbital velocity? Uh, I think um, both work. 
and this is what is being hidden by the standard representation of, of the Breze wavelength. So I will talk about it. But then you have the Planck Einstein relation and, and whatever. So these uh, combined uh, quantities that are relative. Uh, the, whose measurement depends on a frame of reference and then these uh, nature's constants, uh, which I which, uh, said, I think the uh, revision of the system of SI units, 2018-19, that, that basically defines it. You know, you cannot reduce it any further. So um, again, what is reality? It's, it's a whole, we describe it. We have a, we have a language, uh, these equations uh, to describe it. We have symbols that are... Uh, whose meaning is, is not uh, ambiguous. Uh, it's a closed system. Uh, I think Occam's razor principle applies. It's the, the simplest of, of theories that, uh, that explains everything that we have now. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's it. Um, that's the world. Uh, the whole of, uh, of fact. That's a fact. So uh, don't, don't, um, don't get lost like the, the Greek philosophers uh, or, or the early uh, uh, medieval philosophers uh, who further build on uh, uh, Aristotle and Plato and uh, you know asked uh, the, the, all, all of philosophy is in these equations of physics and um, and if you think it through and make a clear distinction between you know the the concepts in your head and and what is out there um, or what we are trying to describe then I, I don't see any metaphysical, epistemological, or, or, um, or scientific problem. Yeah, I, I would talk about, uh, I, I'll, I'll go fast because I've been uh, talking. The, um, the Breuse relation, the matter wave, the concept of the matter wave, and you always see that uh, lambda is equal to uh, H divided by uh, P, uh, so Planck's quantum of action divided by momentum, that this is sort of a, the, the thing is, I, I sort of, uh, no one really gives a, a geometrical explanation of, a, of, of the Breuse wavelength. So this is also where sort of like, you know, I want to be able to understand an equation in terms of, you know, 3D space and time. What is that wavelength? What is the matter wave's frequency? Uh, what is the frequency we get out of the Planck-Einstein relationship? I want to... I want to visualize that. And that's where I dug into um, uh, the original writings. It's always good to read the classics, uh, the Breuer's original uh, PhD thesis. And that's where I found uh, hey, this guy was quite logical, actually. And, and the, the, the way, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a modern physics handbook, you see uh, the Breuer's relationship uh, being presented as lambda is h divided by p. His original uh, relation in, in his thesis is, uh, is this actually he sort of starts and it's just one or two pages really the introduction only you need to read and he says okay we have an equivalence um, of, of matter and uh, energy that's what he says uh, uh, einstein this is why einstein probably loved him so much and pushed his thesis and he said then we have the planck einstein relation uh, uh, for uh, the, the law for radiation uh, because the planck einstein relationship that e is a h time uh, F, uh, this is a new symbol there, E is H time, it's not a V, it's, a, it's another symbol for the frequency, now we write it as F, but I want to quote the original. So we, we solved the black body radiation problem uh, um, by a uh, law of radiation that says, you know, photons, the energy of a photon must obey, and uh, so these are light particles, huh? photons, must obey that law, uh, Planck's quantum of action times uh, the frequency of the photon. So how, how can we combine these, uh, these two very different things? Because mass energy, we associate mass with matter particles, so we have E is mc squared, and the Planck-Einstein relationship, uh, which at that point in time, uh, in uh, the early 20s, um, you know, was, was for, for light particles. Huh? Uh, where be, okay, they have a relativistic mass, they have a, a pushing momentum, light has a, a pushing momentum. Uh, there's there's uh, a pushing momentum in radiation. So, um, but, but how do we combine it? And he said like, uh, yeah, maybe we should, and this is, uh, I will literally translate from the French. And uh, you really need to, to read this uh, a couple of times, but then it fall, things fall into place. We may conceive that because of some grand law of nature, it's, it really sounds much better in French, but, um, but yeah, a periodic phenomenon of frequency nu zero. So he, he, he doesn't talk about a linear 
uh, or a wave function or uh, at this point he talks about a periodic phenomenon very vague so i said now in the meanwhile i interpret it as, as as an orbital oscillation charge oscillation but in his thesis talks said there's like a periodic phenomenon there right uh, of a certain frequency and uh, we should associate that with, and this is the, the brilliance of the Bray, uh, he doesn't talk about a, a matter particle, but of, of an energy packet. So he, he's writing about the matter wave, he thinks about protons and electrons, and he says, you know, we would associate that with an energy packet. And he writes that because he said, indeed, yeah, protons, electrons, matter particles, we associate them with mass, but, uh, you know, the mass energy equivalence relationship tells us that mass is equivalent to energy and this equivalence this is the brilliance of the Bray says that you know mass particle matter particles we should think of them as energy packets uh, unlike a photon they have a rest mass m0 so again we may conceive that we should associate a periodic phenomenon of frequency nu zero with each matter particle energy packet with a, with, that has a non-zero rest mass m0 such that and and this is the brilliance where he equates the energy in the esmc square relation and the e the energy in that uh, h times f relation with each other the Planck's quantum of action times this frequency which he doesn't define uh, at that moment as, as in terms of uh, is a linear frequency an orbital frequency or what kind of frequency uh, he doesn't he doesn't define he just puts that equation there and this is the Bray's original equation h times the frequency this periodic uh, thing that we would associate with, with a matter particle with an energy packet would be equal to m0 uh, c square so he's talking here clearly, uh, and that, that's what he spells out. Then he said, "Okay, this this new the frequency. Uh, I use the subscript zero, um, and also for the rest mass m zero uh, of an electron. We're talking about uh, we're measuring this in the rest frame of the matter particle itself. So that equation uh, h times f zero, uh, the, the frequency as measured." in the rest frame of our mother particle should be equal to the rest mass uh, which is the mass of the particle the electron proton in its own frame of reference times c square that makes sense because you know if you look at uh, uh, matter particles as energy packets basically without specifying if it's sort of an electromagnetic uh, oscillation or some charge oscillation you know the, the brain had no idea about you know what I now see is that sort of you know we should think of particles as, as some um, some oscillation of charge. He um, he put that equation there. That's the Bray's equation. It is not lambda is divided by uh, is equal to h divided by p. Uh, I will show you that that equation makes sense, but its uh, its geometric interpretation is something very different. Than, than what you will see in mainstream physics, where they say, so, okay, we can explain it when we do a superposition of, you know, slightly different frequencies and blah, 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 and this and that with the uncertainty. And uh, it creates a big mess and uh, it's an inconsistent and it creates indeed runaway, uh, you know, the dissipation relation doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, but what's being modeled by interpreting this frequency as a linear frequency, that's what I argue, I put the, uh, the reference there in the, the, the publication that has uh, got most downloads, 12,000 something now, the Breus Matter Wave uh, concept and issues on my research gate page. Um, uh, look at that, that's sort of where I go. I, I start from that, we say the Breu, he was a genius. He, he knew the energy somehow in the two most fundamental relations in, in physics, the mass energy equilibration, equivalence relation and the Planck-Einstein uh, law for radiation or, or uh, must apply uh, must be the same energy must apply to to matter particles as well electrons protons and so uh, if we equate the two e's to the energy then we we get this equation uh, and then we can use the Lorentz transformation formulas to see what what frequency we get in in another frame of reference in our frame of reference when we have a moving electron or a moving proton and then the zero disappears 
and then we just have uh, h times f the frequency of, uh, of our matter particle is uh, its mass times c square and um, and that is really it for me it was a big uh, um, a big aha erlebnis to say like okay uh, and he he does that huh? the de Bruyne's original idea uh, is valid um, so th this is also where I feel I'm not presenting a new theory. I'm, I'm actually going back, and I think there was this junction where um, where De Bruyne uh, thought, okay, frequency, frequency, uh, uh, maybe applying this this thing, uh, thinking about radiation, there must be some linear um, oscillation, just like photon is a, is a linear oscillation of an electromagnetic field. It's a traveling disturbance. Where, where he didn't think like for matter particles, maybe we should think in terms of, um, you know, uh, orbital frequencies of some kind of charge that goes around and around a point like charge. It's kind of weird for me because you see so many things that are written where you think like, hey, they're almost there. Um, uh, I often quote Dirac, uh, the uh, a passage in his Nobel Prize uh, speech from 1933, I think. 1932, uh, where he talks about that, you know, we say, okay, we have Schrodinger's equation, it appears really that, you know, you have like um, uh, an oscillation that is, uh, you know, on, on top of its linear motion, um, you know, there's something happening there, and, uh, and it must be at speed of light, you know, the, 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 the most trivial solution to Schrodinger's equation and Dirac's equation is is the elementary wave function and uh, I, I i don't get why these people didn't get the aha lateness that that i had uh, dirac returns to it in the 60s where he does develop an electron model um not the right one but but by then he was out of grace i would say he you know, was no longer invited to um the Solvay conferences after the, the, the Second World War. Um, I write about that in uh, the more historical overviews, where I um, where I think things went wrong. The the young wolves took over. Uh, they said, Let, "Let's get on with these equations that we don't understand. Let's get on with this frequency we don't understand, and and try to make sense of it." But uh, the more the, the, the more interpretations and, and uncertainty principles and a lot of equations they've added and the, the, the more advanced the math became, the, the, the more mysteries get added to it. And, and this is where I think uh, that, that my model makes sense. I promised I would, um, I would say a few things about um, um, the Bruce equation as is presented this, this lambda uh, um, i'm not going to be too long on that because um, i've been talking for a long time but um but this is sort of what you get i mean for an electron uh, look at this this picture that i i, I got from um, i quoted them also for vasallo uh giorgio uh, and uh di tomaso and um what's their mentor they're they're into cold fusion they they made this model we see this black ring uh, uh, ring current and so what a model in this picture is actually uh, you know it's the same principle uh, the distances get measured here just because of natural units by by one divided by uh, uh, an electron volt so that's just a different unit and uh, you know they use natural um measurement units, which I think confuses the picture. If you convert back, you will see this black ring. The radius is, is what we refer to as the Compton radius. So that's the uh, interaction radius of, a, of, a, of an electron uh, with, with, uh, when, you, when you shoot photons at it. So it is, that's the, the, the effective radius of that electromagnetic oscillation that is generated by a, a ring current that follows that circular trajectory uh, on, on this black uh, ring. Now, um, what this picture showed me, there was another a higher lateness, is that, uh, you know, in this theory, in this, this model, uh, oscillator model, where we say, like, okay, um, uh, this point-like charge has no rest mass. In that sense, it is photon-like. Of course, it's not a photon. Um, it, uh, but it has no rest mass, and so it does acquire... Uh, you know, it, 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 it zitters around. It, uh, it also goes back to a, a zitter bewegung um, uh, hypothesis that Schrödinger, you know, Schrödinger, I think he was also unhappy. He gets counted to sort of, you know, Dirac and uh, uh, I think Schrödinger was, was a bridge and, uh, you know, I, I don't think he even went to, uh, to collect his Nobel Prize. 
because he fell out with Iraq, he fell out with Bohr. Uh, he moved from uh, the German University to Oxford basically because of uh, a Nazi uh, ideology. He did not share with Heisenberg, so he was at Oxford. He was unhappy there. Uh, he went to Ireland. Um, so, so Schrödinger himself, I, I still think of him. On one of my videos, I put his gravestone, which which has Schrödinger's equation. I think he saw this, and uh, his his Titterbewegung hypothesis for some reason didn't get picked up by Heisenberg and and by Bohr, the later Bohr. Um, despite the fact that it's uh, it's a pretty nice. Um, explanation of, of, of his own equation, which itself improves the Bohr model of an atom uh, a lot by uh, allowing all kinds of elliptical orbitals and, and on these nice shapes you see uh, that, that get derived from his wave equation, which, which I think is relativistically correct. I explain it in the paper. Uh, once you get, you interpret the, the Breu's uh, wavelength as, as an orbital frequency, um, you see what wave equations make sense and, and which don't and and there's a lot of arguments where saying oh Schrodinger's equation is not relativistically correct it is and Dirac's equation is the electron equation but it doesn't work but it must be correct well it falls falls into place with um basically Schrodinger's city bewegging interpretation of an electron and Dirac refers to it um they say this thing doesn't dissipate away it makes a lot of sense and then he he's for some reason he doesn't further develop it but to go back to this illustration when you have that electron sittering around, orbiting around, with this ring current model of, of an electron, and then you think about it, okay, the speed of that point-like charge inside, uh, which explains the anomaly in the magnetic moment, which also explains the heart uh, scattering, you know, a photon that messes with the electron, but, you know, the, the, the outgoing photon has exactly the same kinetic energy. It's like it bounces off the, the, the point-like charge uh, rather than messing with the electromagnetic field of the electron as a whole. Uh, you know, when you think about that point-like charge, you know, acquiring some lateral velocity, uh, and, and I mean, then I talk about the electron, this ring current, you know, moving as a whole in, in some X or Y or Z direction, uh, acquiring some linear velocity. This uh, ring current becomes like a, a spiral uh, and Archimedes screw, uh, I, I got inspired also a lot by a computer programmer, um, Jason Hise, um, who, who makes uh, uh, incredible animations in which he shows that, you know, the 720 degree symmetries of wave functions we get in quantum mechanics, um, you know, 720 degree symmetries can easily be interpreted in 3D space as, you know, rotations within rotations uh, as long as, and, and so that's where I also thought like, okay, um, the 720 degree symmetries that you get in quantum mechanics where mainstream physicists say, well, you can never understand that, you know, that means that the wave function, you know, we, we cannot understand it in terms of 3D space and time. Um, we, we can, when you think rotations within rotations, on my first slide, the background is, is actually a drawing that Jason Heese made for me. Um, you you can and uh, for a proton it's going to be complicated but let's let's look at the electron here and try to interpret the Breuer's uh, uh, relation for the electron. Uh, here you see uh, different linear uh, velocities of the electron as a whole. You see it for uh, uh, theta bewegung trajectories for different electron speeds. It's called, and I really have to credit these these Italian physicists. I'm not so good with um, uh, I want I want to learn with visualizing uh, the, these kind of complicated uh, trajectories. So uh, the black one is for um, no no lateral velocity. The v uh, the, the v is this, this uh, linear velocity divided by c. Uh, the c is the orbital velocity. I would say in a ring current model. Um, v is just the classical velocity of the electron as a whole. So if it's zero, we have the black ring current. Uh, if it's um, uh, the relative velocity becomes 0 0.43, I don't know why they chose that value, but like a significant fraction of um, of light speed, uh, uh, 0 0.43 is almost half. Then you get that brownish uh, yellow, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the blue, uh, the, the, the bright blue um, uh, thing. So you see that the radius actually of the, um, of the ring current 
uh, as the, the the point lock charge now only it doesn't it moves not only in uh, around and around and around but it also moves a little bit sideways then it takes away uh, some of the orbital velocity and so the radius of the and it, it all makes sense this is what I put then in the um, uh, on, on the left hand side these equations that look so monstrous the phase of the elementary wave function so that's Euler's number uh, you've seen that many times plus or minus the imaginary unit uh, and then between brackets uh, this delta and this delta is written as you know the energy the relativistic energy times t minus uh, often it's it's not written as a vector product but but I do it here p hmm, linear momentum times the exposition that is the phase uh, that you will see uh, look at any standard book of physics uh, in the elementary wave function uh, Euler's number um plus or minus that's direction of spin that's also where you know <laughs> plus or minus uh, the 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 edx course i did on quantum physics quantum mechanics started like that well you know we can use the plus or the minus it's just a matter of convention it's linked to you know this imaginary unit uh that's counterclockwise or clockwise we could uh, use both um that's a figure below there i'm going like no uh plus or minus makes a difference uh so going from plus one uh, position to minus one position there in, in mathematics it doesn't matter uh, e uh, or there's number times plus uh, 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 the imaginary unit times pi uh, is equal to uh, in mathematics it is equal to e minus uh, the imaginary unit times pi but you know the imaginary unit in the quantum physics that's a rotation operator and it, it matters if you rotate something and point like charge or whatever you're gonna spin it in this direction or you're going to spin it around in that direction so um, in physics all the, the, this sort of nonsense uh, disappears because you recognize that um, um, e plus minus ep and e minus ep is not just some common phase factor that you know suddenly sim simplifies stuff but to go back to the elementary wave function so instead of pi uh, uh, we take that phase delta uh, so in the, the figure below the, the delta the phase of the of the wave function is pi uh, or you have uh, 90 degrees but in, in uh, quantum physics that uh, phase angle goes incredibly fast uh, because um, that's its argument uh, it has the energy uh, times uh, t uh, where, where, where that point like charge is literally this is the, the position the t and the x are the position of a point like charge uh, zittering around and so when that point like charge has no linear um, momentum when the electron as a whole has no linear momentum then p and x are just zero now we have that black current that black ring current so it's at zero and now we just have the energy at the bottom there e zero the rest energy of the of the electron as a whole divided by h bar times t um, t axon uh, what is it in english t uh, prime so we measure the energy and time in the rest frame of the electron and then the phase argument is it will be that e0 divided by h bar and we can when we look at this relative motion eh, for v divided by c square equal to 0 0.43 or 0 0.86 yes, which is the, the yellow line or 0 0.98 moving close and then we have a, a, a relativistic energy which depends on this velocity this velocity will not be zero and we have a linear momentum of the electron as a whole px and and you know we can go back and forth this is what i show in, uh, in in that equation on, on the left hand side um, you know apply Lorentz formulas and you go from e0 uh, to um, or from ev uh, the subscript v to e0 and and back uh, the energy the, the relativistic energy uh, ev is equal to the the energy as measured in, in the rest frame of the um, electron divided by that Lorentz factor uh, which i told you is just uh, one minus 
the relative velocity square, the v square over c square. And uh, momentum, the relativistic momentum, um, that's a bit more complicated to write out. Um, I use the relativistic formula to substitute P and write it in terms of energies. Uh, I should check that. I think it's P square. Yeah, in case that's uh, one I should check, but you can check that actually. You can write linear momentum in terms of an energy. Um, and uh, and then you have a c square factor and uh, you go back and forth sorry i should have prepared that one but go to go to my paper and um, the explanations of each of the steps that are taken there the, the point is really that um yeah you have two uh, uh, representations of the of the same reality the reality is depicted in that graph uh, and with the, with the black ring, the black uh, ring current and and then the bluish and the yellowish and the red thing that that's the reality there and what we measure the energy of the electron as it moves uh, through space or it doesn't in its own um, uh, rest frame uh, that's the phase argument and it's interesting to see that it's uh, relativistically invariant uh, that the, the the delta the phase of the elementary wave function is the same it does not depend on your on your frame of reference so it's like the electric charge itself the elementary charge or it's like Planck's quantum or it's like um, the speed of light you know this phase argument in the elementary wave function is invariant of your reference frame and that's where uh, and this sounds philosophical because I just said like and maybe contradictory to what I said like you know relative and absolute quantities and whatever you know it's all everything is real um, but this is why I believe the elementary wave function really represents the proton or the electron or whatever elementary particle well there's basically these these two so for me a neutron is a is a is a, is a combined motion of um, of well a motion of, of com combination of electric uh, of positive and negative electric charge um, but an electron and proton and their antimatter counterparts and i have a theory for dark matter as well but um you know that's represented by that elementary wave function that that the rotation um of the the point like charge inside must be real and the point like charge inside must be real and uh, etc and etc et the only difference is that uh, when you look at a proton you go from uh, a disk like view to uh, a point like charge that sits around a, a 3d sphere on a 3d sphere and so then you have that factor four in your Planck Einstein relation um, which is uh, not a natural explainer in my last paper in my last lecture uh, it's the same four factor that you have uh, the Gaussian factor when you talk about uh, you know radial radiation going out in a, in a 3d space uh, it's the same factor that you have when you know the surface of a sphere is is four times a pr squared um, while the, the circumference of a circle is is only pr squared so the same four factor you have that four factor when you talk about the the angular momentum or the inertial mass of a, of, a, of a point like mass going around or you have you know a, a solid disk um, and yeah i said you, you just combine uh, this is the easiest combination uh, e is a planck einstein relationship uh, and and then we have the orbital uh, frequency c uh, sorry velocity c is a, a times w we apply uh, you know we, we equate we apply the planck einstein sorry the mass uh, energy equivalence relationship and we get the radius of an electron and in blue we get the radius of a proton um, there's one thing i want to say here i said it in my uh, previous no i did not actually in my previous uh, presentation is um would it be possible that this this motion is Sort of chaotic, uh, irregular, and that uh, you know this this uh, this is sort of an idealist view of of a ring current. Maybe the speed of this point like charge sometimes is less than c, sometimes because that would be the implication more than c. Uh, I, I I don't think so. I mean velocities uh, um, of anything, uh, a photon or or a point like charge, cannot be um, larger than c. Superluminal velocities don't exist it's something clear because uh, yeah, I, I got a paper you know the super luminal graviton can you have a look at my model um i, I switch off uh signals uh, 
you know there's this yeah when you have a dissipation relationship the idea of of, of, of a packet uh, of, of of waves a group packet that uh, on, on, in theory can have a superluminal velocity as, as, as a group but that's because that the uh, dispersion relationship doesn't make sense and we, we don't have a a, tr a group of waves traveling and and you know that's modeling our uncertainty that's not modeling the real thing so i think the motion is 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 regular for sure uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to precisely measure the radius and magnetic moment uh, of um, and also i don't think it's a, it's not like an electron in an um, in uh, an atomic orbital it's not like the hydrogen atom where uh, you know this the spiral wave, you know, you also have these, but you can have very complicated trajectories, elliptical, uh, where the, the radius varies, and, uh, and this is what Schrödinger's equation models on. The radius varies, the, the, the classical velocity of the electron as a whole varies uh, between zero and, and C. Um, for an elementary particle here, this electron, I, I do believe, and you may disagree, is that it, it's really this weird um, uh, mathematical object a real uh, ring current, um, a real equilibrium situation, a uh, ring current that generates the, the field that keeps it in place. It is really that perpetual mobile, and there's um, there's no uh, there's no funny stuff happening there. Otherwise, we would have uh, indeterminism. We would have an uncertainty principle, but one that's far worse than <laughs> the uncertainty principle in quantum physics now, is because that's the ambiguity. There's uncertainty, but we you know the equations give pretty precise results um so i believe heisenberg's uncertainty principle is a bit nonsense uh we, we we the uncertainty is always an imprecision in our measurement or you know other stuff but you know things we can't explain or when we make a measurement we disturb the system you know th that that's uncertainty that's the real uncertainty that has nothing to do with a real sort of metaphysical um randomness in nature uh, nature is not random um, so I, I do believe this this shape is um, is what it is and a proton is also uh, a, what it is something very definite uh, and something that the yeah, packs uh, uh, Planck's quantum of action in in a very specific shape and that four factor is the shape factor I would say the three-dimensional aspect of, of a proton uh, and that's also confirmed by you know the these packing models of a nucleus, uh, yeah, neutrons, protons seem to be uh, uh, 3D spheres rather than uh, than, than ring currents. Um, uh, it works different. So um, uh, that's where we are. Um, I wanted to show then now to go to the. Um, uh, I promised that. So um, let me actually go um, back. I hope this works on the video. Uh, I put a. Um, uh, no, I cannot go back. There was there was a small um, while well, recording. Uh, I cannot go back to the previous slide. There was on the previous slide um, um, sort of a graph that I put there. When when we have a certain uh, lateral velocity of the point like charge, so some of the uh, light speed um, goes now horizontally, and so this, this this ring current becomes like you know a spiral. Okay, an Archimedes spiral. Uh, what, what you can see is that it's a very uh, special uh, geometric shape. Um, you, you can clearly see there's a, a sort of a frequency or a wavelength there between the, the, the crests uh, or the, or the, th the troughs uh, of that you know spiral. Huh? The, 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 the electron goes around in a spiral, and in between you know it makes one rotation, and there, there's a distance between these crests, huh? and it's quite regular. So that's a frequency. That's not the Bryce frequency. Uh, that's the um, the uh, that, that's that's a sort of a horizontal distance, uh, which which I call just lambda. Uh, and this is not the lambda in the lambda that is the h uh, divided by p formula. This is this 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 horizontal distance between uh, wave crests, I would call it. So it is really like photon-like. Huh? Think about it. You know, instead of an electromagnetic uh, field vector going around uh, and, and, and traveling through space, you can use exactly the same visualization of that. But the difference is that we're not talking about an electromagnetic field vector. We're really talking about a point-like charge that goes around and around in a spiral-like structure. And we have a horizontal distance, which we can call a length, 
which I call a wavelength because we have a cyclical uh, linear um, fetcher of that very complicated, well, not so complicated, it's a spiral. Uh, so that's the lambda there. So that, that's not uh, the De Bruijs um, wavelength. De Bruijs wavelength, the symbol I use, uh, let me see my notes here, is, um, is a lam lambda p. Uh, why do I use the subscript p? Because uh, the Bryce wavelength, if you look at it, if, if there is no uh, momentum, we uh, in, the, in the the way the Bryce wavelength is classically presented as lambda divided by h divided by p, p is zero when there is no uh, linear motion. When there when there is when in in the rest frame uh, of the um, of the electron or the proton, when it doesn't move, when we're looking, you know, uh, from our inertial frame of reference, and we we hold an electron or a proton, let's say in some, well, no, actually, because in a penning trap, uh, I would say, there, there is no example. We cannot hold an electron or a proton. In a penning trap, it's it's trapped in an electromagnetic field, and it will also fold. Oh, actually, a quite interesting geometrically um, shape, uh, sort of a spiral-like. Um, thing but then fold it up in 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 a circle but um suppose we could do that that we could hold an electron in in position or a proton in position then it would have no linear momentum huh? so it would be zero and this is also where i thought like this de Bruyne relationship doesn't make much sense because um the lambda uh, is it becomes infinite huh? h uh, finite quantity Planck's quantum of action divided by zero, p is zero. Uh, the electron or proton is not moving. It does not have any linear momentum. So we have something divided by zero, so that gives infinity. And this is also where I thought like this, the, the geometric ex, uh, uh, explanation of the Bruce wavelength is not going to be easy, but it, uh, it's, it's probably possible because the, the mathematical behavior, which I put on these graphs here, is um is uh, yeah we have a lot more frequencies um, and and which one do we have we surely have that lambda and sort of the wavelength between uh, the the crest then we have the the compton wavelength which are called frequency of the of the electron itself that sort of uh, you know the energy of the electron is h uh, um, the quantum time is the frequency so if we have a frequency with the Compton frequency I would say of thing then we can calculate and associate a wavelength with that and that's the lambda C uh, the Compton frequency so we have that weird length and then um, you know I worked it out in my paper um, uh, I'm not gonna go too much in detail but that these are the quantities you see here and um, and you can um, calculate those relationship and I just sum them up here you find that the Bruce wavelength times that that sort of linear fetcher of that spiral-like movement, um, you know, we can rewrite it as beta, which is the relative velocity, you know, that, that linear velocity, V divided by C, uh, so that's the beta factor, uh, times the, um, the Compton uh, frequency, so that's the frequency of the electron, this the Bryce, the Bryce frequency uh, wavelength, uh, as he put it in his original thesis, uh, and in the rest mass. And then you can rewrite that because um, uh, the, the the wavelength c that's that's actually uh, uh, not the radius of the electron, the Compton radius, but the circumference we associate with it. So we'll have h bar divided by m c, but not h bar, but h huh? multiplied by two times pi. And uh, we have the beta factor there, and uh, and that's what I showed that that uh, um, v uh, the Bruce wavelength h divided by by um, the the the, the, uh, the linear momentum p we can rewrite it as beta uh, m times c in relativistic terms, and um, we see we have two times h divided by m c so that's the square. Of lambda c square and we have this very nice relationship between this lambda the Bruce wavelength uh, uh, the ratio of it is b square uh, this product uh, uh, the Bruce wavelength times the lambda is is, uh, is, uh, is is the Compton wavelength squared we can um, write then that uh, this product is equal to um, 
lambda squared, lambda, the Compton radius squared. And, um, and that's actually where I would need to look it up, actually. I should have prepared the one. Um, ah, yeah, in natural units. Uh, it will be equal to 1 divided by mm squared. Uh, yeah, I switched to natural units um, there. Uh, C, so the velocity of light is 1. Uh, and also H, I equate that to 1. Uh, it has an implication on how we measure. Uh, but we, we get uh, this formula. Uh, that the Bray's wavelength, the product of the Bray's wavelength times uh, this, this linear wavelength that you get when, when a proton starts moving is equal to the square of, the, of its Compton radius. And that, that's a very magical formula. It doesn't give a, a straightaway um, geometric interpretation of the Bray's wavelength. Uh, we do have a very clear view of what lambda is that linear wavelength, we do have a very clear uh, geometric interpretation of the Compton radius, and hence this, this Compton wavelength. Um, but the Bryce wavelength obeys that relation, and that this is uh, yeah, something you may want to think about further. Um, we have the product of the Bryce wavelength times the lambda is, is lambda c squared. That's the Latus rectum formula. And that's a very um, uh, nice formula. I already told you relativity theory actually can be sort of reduced to, uh, you know, the formula for a circle eh? because the inverse of the Lorentz factor is, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is the formula for a circle. Uh, uh, the y coordinate will be equal to square root of uh, one minus the x coordinate. Here, uh, the Breuil's wavelength is the only geometric uh, interpretation I have. It, it obeys the the Latus rectus formula, and and you can see that it goes indeed from from zero um, for p is zero, and uh, that's the, the green curve there, and then it goes to one uh, for um, you know when the linear velocity, if we would accelerate. A proton or an electron to light speed which we can't because that's the limit it has no rest mass but then i mean okay let's see then then, then it becomes one so the the, the Bray's wavelength uh, this is one of the reasons it goes from from infinity down to one and it follows this nice shape um, which is given by that circular arc and one minus beta uh, that, that product and it's it's a lot of rectum formula it's one of these beautiful um things that that links um beautiful mathematical formulas that have to do with elliptical uh, and circular stuff with with the with this deep equation in in physics that gives us the relation between the Bray's wavelength and linear compton uh, wavelength um so um so yes i'm at um i i will not say more about this because uh I read about it in the paper uh, and I haven't, I haven't uh, figured. This is, this is beautiful. This is, uh, you know, I told you I understand the equations. I understand uh, the mass energy equivalence relationship. This is a relationship where I say, like, okay, uh, I probably don't fully understand because there's like various layers in understanding here. Um, maybe uh, the next generation will, will, will get this. Okay, we're at the end. Uh, and then we're not. I want to conclude uh, because this is a lecture on, on like philosophy and physics. So, so what is our worldview then? You really have these uh, electrons, protons quite defined. Um, based on that, we have we have an understanding of what they are, of what reality is. Of course, and the reality is these electrons and protons. You know, they, they will form electron and proton forms hydrogen. And now we can have at, at, at atomic orbitals, uh, you know, and then all kinds of complications are there. Then spin coupling between the electrons and the spin of the of, of a proton. Uh, when we have two protons, we need a neutron to glue these together. I said you don't have two proton nucleus. No, we will be. A, uh, a, a neutron in it so um, so then you have all these uh, yeah, complicated things arriving but the funny thing is so we are here uh, we are understanding this all and then as as human beings our mind and this is probably the, the the most fascinating thing i find that we are sort of in this um, our mind is is able to understand these things and and there's 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 no mystery left i would say and at the same time, you know, it's it's a very mysterious world. Uh, how these anorganic, how atoms, uh, heavier atoms get get created in uh, the whole cosmology, 
uh, in, in solar stars it creates heavier elements and then these elements combine you know nitrogen and hydrogen uh, and, and 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 carbon and uh, so these then combine in anorganic molecules and these anorganic molecules then uh, combine in um, because they're stronger right? it's, uh, apparently the combination the, the energy is lower so uh, at, at, atoms when suitable and when all the let's say, momentum uh, all these oscillations you know went back together in, in a molecule uh, it, it doesn't get easily destroyed so you have very stable molecules then and these stable molecules then form organic material organic material like enzymes or um, uh, proteins and they're still anorganic but then these combine in cells which which prove to um, to be stable and reproduce and uh, so we have these laws of natural selection in terms of what is stable what is not stable both in um, the anorganic world and then uh, in the organic world and that forms then cells and cells get very complicated and uh, and combine in in the first uh, very primitive uh, life forms and these very primitive life forms have uh, what you call then a dna a sort of a, a blueprint for um, their, their reproduction uh, and so on and so on and so you layer after layer uh, <laughs> you wonder like whoa um, the last layer is uh, yeah, how our brain works eh? um, we've got concepts and we can think about these things and we um, we, we can see ourselves uh, in a kind of um, very special way not just a mirror of me looking in the mirror and seeing someone with two eyes and nose and uh, a rather strange appearance and talking nonsense um, no I see myself as being um, um, Feynman talks about a glass of wine here which is far less complicated than, than I am than you are and, um, and and look what he what the beauty he what he writes about a, a glass of wine a poet once said the whole universe is in a glass of wine uh, we will probably never know in what sense he meant that for poets do not write to be understood but it's true that if we look at a glass of wine closely enough we see the entire universe I like that. if we look at a glass of wine closely enough we see the entire universe um, there, there are the things of physics uh, twisting liquid which evaporates depending on the wind and the weather we see the reflections in the glass and then our imagination uh, adds the atoms uh, I would say well the atoms are there and but indeed we can sort of start to imagine and deconstruct what a glass of wine is in terms of uh, molecules first uh, and then atoms the um, the glass is a distillation of the earth's rocks and its composition we see the secrets of the universe's age which is true in sand the evolution of stars yeah silicium huh? uh, what strange array of chemicals are in the wine how did they come to be there are the ferments the enzymes the substrates the products there in wine and this is a uh, yeah, the, the biology layer is found the great generalization all life is fermentation wouldn't quite agree with that but it's a point nobody can discover the chemistry of wine without discovering as did Louis Pasteur the cause of, of much disease uh, yeah sadly so how vivid is the claret pressing its existence into the consciousness that watches it how vivid is the claret pressing its existence into the, the consciousness us that are watching smelling this glass of wine if our small minds for some convenience divide this glass of wine this universe into parts physics uh, biology uh, geology of the wine astronomy psychology and so on remember that nature does not know it I find that one deep actually nature does not know it um, we are conscious uh, I, th I think here about artificial intelligence if we would be able to, to, to build a thinking machine how would we define this kind of um, um, knowing or, or being consci conscious of things 
Uh, but that's a different question. I have a blog on artificial intelligence um, uh, where I where I wonder about these things. So um, let, let's conclude uh, the lecture and uh, and this quote. Let us put it all back together, not forgetting ultimately for what it is, uh, and that's to give us pleasure. Uh, drink it and forget it all. Um, I would I would drink it, but uh, don't don't forget all. Uh, this is a um, I, I put two other illustrations from this rather remarkable chapter or lecture in his uh, series. It's in uh, the first volume on, on, on pretty classical mechanics and all that, and uh, the third chapter, final lectures, I, I quote there. He, he, he talks about the relation of physics to the other uh, sciences, biology and even and psychology and other stuff and um, the, it's mostly biology uh, organic and organic and that's where I put the uh, you know a schematic diagram of DNA it's figure 3.2 in his lecture and the Krebs cycle which is like the equivalent uh, I would say of uh, the photosynth what happens the photosynthesis uh, process uh, for you know trees grass uh, plants uh, have do, do photosynthesis and uh, they they take uh, co2 and emit uh, oxygen and that's how our our atmosphere got oxygenated um sadly we're cutting a lot of forest in our body we have something similar it's the Krebs cycle um of course we know it's a bit uh, in terms of what goes in and what goes out it's the other other way around we we inhale oxygen and we exhale a lot of co2 and then in our body you know there's the um, um the acidic uh, amino uh I mean, a cycle. I don't know too much about that. My daughter is a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, she knows all about these things. But it's um, it's all rather remarkable. But I do believe that um, you know it's a bit the end of science. That's why it's very disgraceful that uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners in, in physics uh, suddenly uh, have have the pretension to say that uh, you know climate change scientists can't be right. Uh, may, maybe they're not right. Um, but climate change is real and uh, I feel like uh, this this kind of uh, misplaced arrogance from um, physicists uh, the gurus uh, say we can't understand and they're smarter than other scientists um, that that's really misplaced and um, I will um, I will sign off here um, I have a lot of doubts if this was a good lecture it was for sure too long uh, but I'll, I'll put it on the web and then uh, see what happens and uh, what comments it gets. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, probably there are only very few students left. Um, but yeah, even for the one or two who do listen to the end, uh, thank you and have a nice weekend. It's Sunday here in Brussels and uh, I, I am now going out on the bicycle and uh, enjoy the rest of it. Thank you.